Uh, thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And so I indeed am going to talk about incoherent charge dynamics and, and phonons. So let's start with um, conventional charge dynamics and, and phonons, just to, to remember um, a few things. So um, phonons, right, so electrons are charged and they can emit phonons. And so phonons are emitted by particle hole pairs, right? So electrons coming along emits, emits a phonon. Um, so how can that happen? So, so the kinematically, the relevant quantities are the spectral weights of particle hole pairs. So I'm not actually sure, what should I point at? If I point here, yeah, I pointed this thing. So, so now I can't, ah, anyway. Okay, so, so this is omega and K. And so the, at, at uh, low temperatures, the particle hole pairs have, a, have the Lindhard continuum, right? And so this is where, where the particle hole pairs are. Ah, perfect, okay, thank you. Uh, is there a pointer here? Ah, perfect. Right, thank you. Uh, so, so the particle hole pairs live, this is where they live. And then the phonon has some dispersion. So for example, here I plotted an, an acoustic phonon. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it is, right? And so the sound speed is much less than the Fermi velocity. So the acoustic, the phonon mode is pretty flat on, on electronic time scales. It just goes along the bottom. Uh, and so this region here, is where from here to here is where the particle hole pairs are kinematically able to emit a phonon. Okay, and so if we want to see how 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 strongly uh, electrons couple to the lattice, there's going to be some electron phonon coupling, and you're going to have to integrate the electron phonon coupling along this line, which is where the particle hole pairs are able to emit the phonon. Okay, so there's an interplay between two kinematics: the particle hole kinematics, which is this band and the phonon kinematics, which is this line, okay? And that determines uh, how, how they can interact. Yeah, makes sense? So pick, pick your favorite uh, phonon dispersion, and that'll be some, some line on this, on this curve. Now, that's all fine, and this is, that's been understood for uh, almost 100 years. So, however, in, in uh, strange metals, uh, it seems uh, clear uh, I'll review some experiments in a minute, that the density spectral function, so that was this blue curve, uh, just does, does not have the Lindhard form, and particularly does not have this sharp, so this Lindhard form has a sharp singularity at small k and at, at, a, and at, two, at 2 kf, right, at the two sides of the Fermi surface. Right, so uh, that, that band, right, comes from a small k, at low energy, you can either be, be close, or you can go all the way to the, to the other side of the Fermi surface, and that's responsible for this band, right? This is 2kf here. These are low energy uh, fermions doing that. And so, uh, this, so this structure is very much based around having coherent excitations that live on the Fermi surface. Uh, so as I'm gonna tell you, that just uh, does not, by definition almost, is not the case in the incoherent metal. And so if the spectral density is not of this form, then obviously that's going to make a big difference on the electron phonon coupling. Okay. So an example of what an incoherent uh, spectrum might look like. So the, these somewhat recent uh, experiments on BISCO, these are these M eels uh, experiments. So what, what, is the, what is measured is, is, there, is this quantity, right? How, how many charged excitations there are as a function of omega and K. This K squared is pretty much fixed by, by kinematics. And then what the point here is there's hardly any K dependence. So this thing is basically just flat as a function of K, all right? And so in particular, there is not a 2KF. There are not these sharp features. So this, is, this, uh, this plot is at quite high frequencies. So this is a line sort of like, like this at quite high omega. But what is missing are these features where you, enter, where you see the sort of sharp edges of, of the Fermi surface, okay? Another example is from this cold atom simulation of the Hubbard model. So, so I think this is actually, it's, it's pretty interesting. I'll tell you how the, okay, yeah. So the way the experiment goes is you set up, you have your, your Hubbard model in a, in a trap, right? You engineer your cold atoms to, to have Hubbard model, Fermi Hubbard model interactions. You, um, and you set up a profile, a charge profile 
of the atoms, which is modulated in space, and it has some wave vector k. Okay, and then you let go and you watch it decay, right? And so the amplitude, this is the amplitude. So as a function of time, this amplitude decays. Okay, then you vary k, you change, you change the, the, the modulation, and then you plot the amplitude again for a different k. All right, and so this plot here is the decay of the amplitude against time for different values of k, right? For different wave vectors. And so the point here, when k of a very long wavelength, uh, sorry, let me get this the right way around. Uh, yeah, the long wavelength ones decay, but for shorter wavelength, there's actually a beginning of an oscillation and, and, and so on. And so what this is, is a direct, a very direct position space measurement of this quantity, right? Because you're measuring how, the, how a charge is decaying as a function of omega and, and k. And so their results fit very nicely uh, to this form, which is sort of almost the simplest form you can imagine. If this term were not here, this would be purely diffusive, right? And so this, and so this tau is uh, a boundary between, so if, if this term wins, then here you have a linear dispersion between k and omega, and that's responsible for these oscillations, okay? So there's a crossover as a function of k between a diffusive form and an oscillating form in this function, okay? And this is actually, I think this function also has a very uh, respectable pedigree. It's sort of the simplest, if you're gonna write down a collective form for the charge dynamics, uh, this is the first function you would write down, okay? So, so the upshot here is that it is again, there are no two KF singularities uh, in sight, and instead there's a very collective form uh, for the charge dynamics, okay? Uh, very quite high. It's like at, at um, it's from about one third of the Fermi energy to a few times the Fermi energy. Yeah, but thank you. These are quite quite high. So this is in the bad metal regime of the Hubbard model at quite high temperatures. And and this is two uh, D or three D? Two D. Okay, so all, all of this is to, to motivate. Suppose the electronic dynamics are, suppose if the electronic dynamics give you some incoherent uh, non-Fermi non liquid, take that system and now couple it to phonons. What happens? So what is the formalism in which we can add phonons to an already existing strongly incoherent electronic system? Okay. Uh, another motivation for doing that came from some something I noticed a couple of years ago in, in cuprates. And, and so let, let me ask the following question. So in cuprates, you know, there's some phase diagram and, and, and so on. Um, and so let's say, let's be at room temperature, okay? Now, uh, okay, sorry, before cuprates, let's think about copper for a minute. So, so in copper, uh, we, we know uh, very well that the resistivity as a function of temperature looks something like this, right? And it has this linear form. When does the linear resistivity of copper kick in? It kicks in from about one third of the Debye temperature, okay? So above, above the Debye temperature, the phonons are classical and they scatter with linear and T. And this process starts at about one third of T Debye. Okay, in cuprates, T Debye is maybe 600 Kelvin, something like this. So one third of T Debye, is you know down somewhere down there roughly okay i'll just call it t phonon characteristic phonon phonon scale so here as is well known the resistivity is linear okay and most people believe that has nothing to do with phonons okay in in, in cuprates however the phonons are there and so you could ask the question at room temperature in cuprates, do phonons contribute to scattering or not? So does this T linear resistivity of the cuprates have a contribution which is scattering off classical phonons? The classical phonons are definitely there. Do the electrons see them or not? That's the kind of question that you need a formalism to couple incoherent electrons to phonons, okay? That's the kind of question I would I like to have a formalism for even asking that, that question, right? Say solve, solve. Suppose you believe that the electrons here are described by the Hubbard model, solve the Hubbard model, and then couple it to phonons and ask, do phonons contribute to the scattering or not? Okay. So 
one way to think about this question, let's not start here, let's start over here, okay? At some very high doping, let's say 0.33, just in, in LSCO. So that's beyond, beyond the superconducting dome. Here, at low temperatures, the resistivity is T squared, okay? At, at low temperatures, that's this plot. This is LSCO at 3.3. Okay, well, well, way beyond the superconducting dome at low temperatures. And what's being plotted here is the derivative of the resistivity. Okay, the derivative. That's why it's a bit noisy. Right? So you take a bunch of points, you just take the differences, that's the derivative. Okay. At low temperatures, this is a straight line with intercept basically zero, right? And so if the derivative is T squared with intercept zero, sorry, if the derivative is T with intercept zero, then the resistivity is T squared with no T linear components, okay? So it's a statement I think hopefully familiar to many of you. If you're down here, away from anything interesting, at low temperatures, the relativity is purely T squared, okay? Clearly electrons. But if you go up, when you cross this scale, which is about 150 or 200 Kelvin, which is roughly a third of the phonon scale, there's sort of a kink, okay? And a simple interpret, I mean, this is just data, right? A simple interpretation of this kink is that the line changes and now there's an intercept. This is a derivative. An intercept in the derivative means a T linear term is turning on in the resistivity, okay? So around here, so up here, the resistivity is T plus T squared above this point. There may be many things happening at this scale, but one thing that is happening is that scattering of classical phonons is possible, okay? So a possible interpretation of this kink is the onset of phonon scattering. Uh, let's stop that song. It's exactly what you should expect because the mass gets renormalized also when you go through the phonon scale. Yeah, so two things happen. That you, so phonons do two things. So it's quite, so, so this is temperature. And there's some characteristic scale. Above this temperature, the phonons scatter efficiently, but they don't renormalize because they're too slow. Because above this temperature, the electrons are much faster than the phonons. Below, the phonons don't scatter, but they do renormalize uh, the mass of the phonons. And so a kink in, in the T squared is very reasonable that it happens at the same scale. So okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I have no ideological commitment to this being the phonons but that is at least a simple possible explanation uh, for that. Okay, let's work, suppose that we found some phonon scattering, which has every right to be there, okay? There are phonons in the system, it's a Fermi liquid, you go above the phonon scale, why should you not see phonon scattering? Okay, but then we can ask what happens to these phonons as you go across uh, towards, towards, uh, towards optimal doping, okay? So here the resistivity is purely T linear, there's no T squared components, right? And, and so, uh, so if you keep going, you can do these plots. And actually what, what happens is that this, this kink survives. It's, it remains at roughly the same scale, at the same temperature, but it gets smaller, okay? And, and, and that's because at low temperatures, a T linear term starts appearing, okay? And so that's why at low temperatures, it, it goes up. And eventually the kink disappears at around this doping. So to put it on a phase diagram, uh, you might have seen before. This is a famous plot from this uh, Cooper et al. Uh, paper. And so this feature I'm talking about, by the way, these, these log derivative plots are very obscure, a lot of, a lot of things, okay? But actually, there, you know, there's a little bit of a bending. So this feature I'm talking about is here, and, and it continues until about, till about, at this point, the king disappears, and it merges into a completely uh, t-linear, continuous t-linear all the way, all the way up. Okay. By the way, one of the mysteries, right, of the cuprates is that this T-linear scattering doesn't have kinks in it, okay? It goes straight from low temperature to very high temperature. Well, there is a kink uh, if you're away from optimal doping, but it disappears as you go here. Okay, so what this um, led me to, to think is that it's really urgent to try to disentangle the role of electrons and phonons in strange metals, okay? So, so um, and so to do that, let's, I thought it might be nice not to consider the resistivity, but a different process where electron phonon interactions are really essential. Resistivity is complicated. There are electrons, spins, phonons, collective modes. I wanna consider now a different process uh, which absolutely crucially depend on electron phonon interactions. 
I'm going to think about that process, uh, which I'll tell you what it is in a second, and ask how to apply that to systems that are incoherent. Okay. All right. So all that was motiv motivation, right? So two motivations. There exist incoherent metals where the spectral density is not the Lintard form, and it's plausible that phonons are playing an interesting role uh, in systems that we care about. Uh, so we need a formalism uh, that couples phonons to uh, incoherent metals. Okay, very good. So the, the, the process, the observable that I'm, I'm going to think about is, is dual, has to do with dual heating. And so the, let, me, let me tell you how this, how this. So really, uh, the electrons that, 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 that we like, our Hubbard model uh, li lives here. But in reality, it's coupled. Well, there's, there's, there's the environment, um, the, the, the big environment. And then there's sort of the immediate environment, which is the, the lattice in, in, which the, in which the electrons live. Okay. So the electrons are coupled to themselves, right? They have electronic interactions. They're coupled to the lattice. They're also coupled to the environment. And the lattice is also coupled to the environment. So uh, I'm going to consider, right, I need some structure. to. I don't want to just deal with the most general case of anything. So the idea is going to be, suppose you apply, supply some energy to the electrons. For example, you apply an electric field, right? Or, or you just whack the system with a laser. I'm going to apply some energy to the electrons. Uh, and this energy has to go somewhere, right? Otherwise, the, the electrons are just going to keep heating up all the way to infinite temperature. I'm going to consider a situation where, where they mainly go is into the lattice, okay? And I'm going to consider a situation where this step is slow compared to this step, okay? So what that means is that if you perturb the electrons, they quickly reach an electronic thermal equilibrium, but they're not in equilibrium with the lattice. And then there's a slower process where the electron, where the electrons thermalize with the lattice, that should be very reasonable in these incoherent metals, where the electron interactions are very, very strong. Right? If you believe that the Hubbard model is the underlying essential physics of the cuprates, that means you believe that electronic interactions happen much faster than the interaction, interactions with the lattice. Yes. Okay, even in metals, yeah. So perfect. If you're happy, perfect. <laughs> if you if you believe this in in conventional metals. You should only be even more happy in unconventional metals. That, that that's that's all. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Why why is that so? So it's so uh, okay. I guess I <laughs> I think it might depend on the temperature and and and. But so, for example, as I'll review in a second, the conventional theory of heating does assume that the electric. It is okay. Let, let's just stick with unconventional metals where, where it's more likely to be true. Okay. So, so, and what's this going to buy me is this, there's going to be a, this, this hierarchy of time scales is going to be the theoretical input into what I do. Okay. So, so if they, if they don't, very good. So, there's the simplest model of dual heating is this uh, two temperature model where the electrons have a temperature, the lattice has a temperature, and they thermalize. In reality, you have to consider more complicated things where they're sort of both thermalizing in parallel. Okay. But there's a, the, the simplification, a common simplification is one where the electrons of the lattice thermalize separately and then, um, and then interact. Okay, so, so let, let's, let's, let's put some equations that go with this picture that I just, I just showed you. So, uh, so suppose the electric, so apply an electric field, Okay, and so that pumps energy into the electronic system. Uh, so this thing we're about to show you here, I think is very well known, but uh, it's not so easy to find the equations written down somewhere. So may maybe this is helpful. So when you apply the electric field, that starts heating up the electronic system. That's dual heating, right? And so the energy in the electronic energy starts increasing by E dot J, right? E dot J is the rate at which you're pumping energy into the electron system. If the electron system were a closed quantum system, the temperature would just go off to infinity. So to have a steady state, it's crucial that the, there's, there's some bath where the electrons can dump their energy, okay? That we're, I'm gonna imagine the case where that's the lattice that is dumping the energy, and there's a time scale tau associated with this process, right? So that tau was this process here, right? The rate at which energy is going out of the lattice. So in a steady state, we have a steady, what, what you actually measure, right? You apply an electric field, you measure a steady current. You want this time derivative to be zero. And so you have to balance uh, these, these two terms. 
if you balance these two terms, you see that the electric field leads to a shift in the energy, which causes a shift in the temperature, right? The lattice is going to heat up a little bit, right? By balancing these two terms. So the shift in the temperature is the shift in the energy divided by the specific heat. And now the energy, according to this formula, is given by E dot J. And now at this point, we use Ohm's law to say that J is sigma E. And so we get this. And so the, 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 the electrons are a little bit hotter than they would be uh, proportional to the electric field squared. Okay, So the electric field heats up the electrons a little bit, but because the heat is also constantly going out, uh, it, it, it's, it's stable. Okay, But this means that this electric field shift of the temperature causes a non-ohmic heating, right? So J has the, the original temperature of the lattice times E, but this shift in temperature causes a shift in this temperature. And so in fact, there's an E cubed term uh, because, because the temperature depends on the electric field, right? And so this is one, one, this is the simplest physics of this time scale, okay? Where this time scale appears is it determined, of course, there may be many other sources of non-ohmic um, conduction, but one of them, a universal one, is, is due to dual heating, okay? And so something that we can see in this, I find this formula very, very useful. So if tau goes to, if we turn off the bath, the coupling to the bath, tau will go to infinity and linear response will break down. But for any finite coupling to the bath, as long as tau is finite, if you send the electric field to zero, you will recover Ohm's law, okay? So a non-zero coupling to the bath is crucial to get linear response, but we can take, most of the time we don't care about that because you can take the electric field to zero and then this is, this is uh, subleading, right? So tau to infinity and electric field to zero don't, don't commute. Okay, very good. Another place where this time scale appears uh, is, is when you is in pump probe spectroscopy and there you actually measure the temperature of the electrons as a function of time. Okay, so you whack the electrons with some, some a laser because the electrons have a lower specific heat than the lattice, they heat up much more than the lattice does, right? So most of the energy, most, so you, you whack the system that hit, that the energy goes into everything. The electrons have a lower specific heat, so they, they heat up more. And, and so, and then what, so you, you whack it with one laser and then you start probing it with another laser and you wanted to see how the electron temperature decays over time. Okay, so this one version of this is, is time resolved APEVs, where you, these lasers are actually spatially resolved then you can zoom in on the Fermi surface and you can get plots like, like this one, which actually was in, in Bisco. And so here, uh, let me get it right. That's right. So at, so this is, this is basically the width of the distribution of fermions at the Fermi surface as a function of time. And so at early times, the electrons have been heated up to some very high temperature. So this is broad. And as the electrons cool down, it narrows, right? The, this is the sort of the width of the Fermi Dirac distribution. And so one way to directly measure the temperature of the electrons is to measure the width of the Fermi Dirac distribution on the, on the Fermi surface. And that, that's what this is doing. And so now you can plot. And so this is a plot of the electronic temperature. The red and the, and the black are two different uh, initial temperatures. So, so here, the temperature, you see it, get, it's getting, it gets whacked up then it decays down. Okay, this decay is, is not a trivial thing, but the, the initial decay is exponential. And that also defines this time scale tau okay so this this, this this tau due to coupling to the lattice is a very physical thing okay it determines joule heating it determines uh this this kind of process and clearly it could not exist without the lattice right so the the, the reason I'm, I, I'm talking about this is to identify a process where electron phonon interactions are not optional they're crucial okay resistivity exists without phonons this does not exist without phonons okay the the the, the, the energy needs to leave the system Okay, so this is these kind of probes are, I think, the kind of thing that we should be doing. Well, not me, but uh, other people should should be doing in uh, in these strange metals to really directly see what the electron phonon coupling is doing. Okay, all right, very good. That, so now, so now, uh, what's the theory of this time scale? So, it, in a conventional metal, this existed for a long time, uh, and it, it goes back to to this to the Soviet paper of Kaganov, Lishit, and Tanatarov. And so for non-interacting electrons, they just uh, coupled to phonons, uh, they, they obtain this time scale. 
there's a, a simple formula for it, and the result looks like this. So this is for non-interacting phonons coupled to, sorry, non-interacting electrons coupled to phonons. And so this is the, the this rate, this rate, uh, this is, I, I chose an acoustic phonon, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is the, the temperature over the block Brunei's temperature, uh, which remember that is, um, is, uh, is that. So if, if this was VF, this would be the Fermi energy, but it's V sound. Okay. And this is the natural scale, um, in electron phonon coupling. Okay. So, so, okay, it has this form, there's some, there's some big peak. Uh, so a couple of interesting things. So this, to make this, this plot is very intuitive. The reason it goes to zero here is because there are not, there are not many phonons there, okay, at, at low temperatures. This, the reason it goes to zero at high temperatures is, is more interesting. That's because above the, above uh, this block Munizen scale, the, the electron, the scattering is elastic from the electron's point of view. The electrons are much more energetic than the phonons, right? Because they have their, their the electrons have energy T, but the phonons have energy below, below the scale. And so because the scattering is elastic from the electron's point of view, they don't lose a lot of energy in any, scatter, in any scattering. And because they don't lose a lot of energy, this thermalization becomes slow, right? The rate at which it loses. And so this, this, this decrease at high temperature is not because the scattering is, is weak, it's because the scattering doesn't transfer energy efficiently out of the electronic system. And so there's a maximum, uh, and curiously enough, uh, if the electron phonon coupling is this value, which is a typical value in a, in a non-superconducting metal, uh, this maximum is actually this Planckian scale. Okay, it's, it's, uh... All right, so as a first, so, okay, very good. So we will rewrite this in a second. So what I'm going to talk about now is in, in, in this paper with uh, Paolo uh, Glorioso, who's, who's a, yes. By, by what, sorry, by? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming that that is not, not, not the dominant factor, yeah, indeed. So, so that, that would be, uh, which I think it isn't, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, yeah, actually so something, that, that's kind of like this, right? Where you go straight into the environment and I'm just not, I haven't thought about it. Well, one, one should think about it, I, I agree. Um, um, yeah. Good, so, so what, 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 what we did in this paper is get a formula for tau, for this rate at which you lose energy to the lattice that holds for any form of the um, electronic spectral density as long as the time, uh, the, the, the time scale at which you lose energy is much longer compared to electronic time scale. So the assumption is that the electrons thermalize quickly and then slowly emit, uh, lose energy to the lattice. In that limit, uh, you can sort of treat the energy loss as the perturbation, right? And, and you can get a formula, which I'll, I'll show you. And so the formula, oh, sorry. No. So let me quickly tell you about how the form, where the formula comes from. And, and, and so, um, it's a method that I think should be more widely used in general. And this is, uh, which is this sort of, so there, there's this thing called the memory matrix methods and which are based around Kubo formulae. And, and they're useful precisely when there's one slow process that you want to, that you want to think about. So, for exa so an example is the Druda formula, right? So, so when you have something like this for the conductivity, this is not normally exact, right? This is, there are many time scales in a metal, right? You have no right to have the Druda formula. When is the Druda formula exact? The Druda formula is exact when momentum lives uh, much longer than anything else, okay? So if there's, if, so say you have a translation invariant metal, okay? Then the connectivity would be infinite. And so to get a finite connectivity, you have to break translation invariance. The interactions of everything else can be very strong, but if you break translation variance weakly, then momentum is much longer lived than all other operators. It decays much more slowly, all right? When momentum decays much more slowly, then this time scale in the Druda formula is what Druda originally thought it was, which is the momentum relaxation rates, okay? In a conventional metal, uh, it's not the momentum relaxation rates, okay? But if the metal is very, very clean, then it's the momentum relaxation rate. Then 
this formula can be directly related to a single slow quantity, which is the momentum. Here, the slow quantity is gonna be the electronic energy, right? So the electronic energy in a closed system, the electronic energy is conserved, right? The dots is, is, is zero, right? Now I'm gonna imagine the coupling to the lattice is weak. So the electronic energy is not conserved. Of course, the full energy is conserved, not the electronic energy, and it's much longer lived than typical electronic processes that decay quickly. So when you have one long lived quantity, uh, it's possible to get a formula for this time scale that depends on the two point function of this quantity. So that, that makes sense. Okay, so this, 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 there's a, whenever you have one quantity, one operator that lives much longer than all other operators, it, it, its decay rate controls everything. Okay. So for example, so here, here's the, here's, so the formula you get in, in this case uh, is, um, that this time scale, right, this rate of decay is given by the, the spectral, the, this, this two point function of E dot, right? So E is the, ele the electronic energy. Another way to say it is that the, elec the electronic energy now obeys a Druder like formula, right? So normally this is like a Druder formula, but not for momentum, but for the energy, right? The energy decays slowly, it has a time scale, okay? And so if the energy, electronic energy, obeys this formula, right, which means it, which it will, if it decays slowly, then you can extract this one of a tau using this, right? This, this order of limits are designed to extract, uh, well, this tau from, from this formula. So if you take this formula and you plug it into here, you'll get this tau, okay? Now, but it's interesting, so where E dot just means that you multiply by omega squared. Okay, and but e dots are useful quantity because e dots going to be small. Okay, so what is e dot? So e dot is the commutator of the Hamiltonian, the full Hamiltonian, including the phonons with the electronic energy. Okay, the only part of the Hamiltonian that degrades the the electronic energy is the electron phonon part of the Hamiltonian. So this is the commutator, the electron phonon part of the Hamiltonian with the electronic parts, but the electron phonon part of the Hamiltonian is some electron phonon coupling times the density. So I'm gonna assume this is just the model, which we can simply change, that the phonons couple to the density, right? In, in this, this the simplest, the simplest way. So then here, this just becomes the electron phonon interaction, V of K, and the electronic density, N. But the Hamiltonian with the electronic density, that's just N dot, right? Because this is the electronic Hamiltonian, okay? So this formula, just becomes a two point function for n dot, yeah. which is a purely electronic quantity. And if this time scale is very long, one evaluates this two. So this E dot depends on the electron phonon coupling times, but it's an electronic operator. And so if this time scale is, is very long, you can evaluate this quantity in the theory without the electron phonon coupling. So let me. I think this is an important point. So let me let me. So there, so suppose you have the Hamiltonian is some electronic Hamiltonian plus a small number times the electron phonon Hamiltonian. All right. Then what I'm calculating is the rate, some Green's function for the rate at which at which this decays due to the electron phonon coupling. Right. What I'm showing you here is that this is related to some Green's functions of n dot. But this will have an epsilon squared in front, right? Because H dot comes from the electron phonon term. So it's electron squared. So now this Green's function to leading order, I evaluate it in the epsilon equals zero theory because I already have the epsilon squared out the front. That's the, the trick of this memory matrix is to use these time derivatives to bring out the factors of the small parameter. And then what you have left, you can just evaluate in the theory without the phonons because I already have the epsilon squared, okay? And so now I just need to calculate that. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe, Let's, okay. So, so I might not be able to solve the electronic dynamics, but as long as I can measure this quantity in the electronic system, I now know how to couple it to phonons. I don't have to consider the coupled electronic phonon system uh, non-perturbatively. I'm sorry, say again. Phonon is completely perturbative. Yes, in this sec, that's right. It's being added on perturbatively to some 
And but what the point of doing all this is that the electrons can be as strongly coupled as you like, and but I, the only information I need will be this this single Green's function. Yeah, that's, right. that, that's why it's useful. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you. I think this will become clearer in a second. So for illustrative purposes, not essential. We can consider the simplest an acoustic phonon that has this deformation potential coupling. So that means that the, the electron phonon coupling is acoustic, right? So it's linear in K, and and it okay. So like this is the textbook coupling of electrons and phonons. Right. So this is what you get, right? So I now take this electron phonon coupling and I calculate this Green's function for an arbitrary electronic system. The electrons can be as strongly coupled as you like. And this formula is very intuitive. Okay, so it's a formula for this decay rate. So there's an overall constant, which is just the strength of the electron phonon coupling. You integrate over all possible, we're calculating the rate to which you emit phonons. Right, so you integrate over all possible wave vectors of the phonon. There's a k squared. That that's because it's an acoustic phonon, and, and, and low k acoustic phonons don't, don't like to couple to electrons. There's some typical thermodynamic factor. What this does is tell you that if the phonon that you emit has an energy that's bigger than the temperature, that's exponentially unlikely. Okay, all this form does is say you can only emit phonons with energy less than the temperature. It's very reasonable, right? And then this tells you, this is the NN, this is the spectral weight of the Green's function. Um, it tells you how many electronic excitations do you have that can emit a phonon with momentum K and energy omega K, right? So how many, and this is where all the electronic dynamics just has the height, it gives you this quantity, right? It tells you how many excitations are there in phase space that can emit phonons. And then, and then the rest is just kinematics. So, you then need to get this quantity from the electronic sector. So as an example, you can take this formula and plug in the free fermion version of, 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 of the GNN, which is this guy. And you take the, this, this is the same plot I showed you before. So now you do the integral along the, so this integral here is the integral along the orange line. You do the integral along the orange line of this formula, you put in a Lindhardt form, and you, you'll get this, this the, the Soviet formula on, on the nose. Okay. All right. So just I'm just trying to convince you that this is, is the correct formula. All right. You, if you put in free fermions, you, you'll get the textbook formula for, for this one of a tau. Yeah. Okay. But now we can just, I showed you two, two experimental examples of. Of, of this quantity that were not Lindhardt functions, okay? Say you solve the Hubbard model in a cold atom simulator, and then you say, well, how does it couple the phonons? Well, you have to take, you have to take this quantity from your cold atom experiment and plug it into this formula. Okay, obviously the cold atoms does not have phonons in it, all right? But, but the cuprates do have phonons in it. And so if you believe the cuprates of the Hubbard model, you simulate the Hubbard model, then you put in the, the dispersion the phonon dispersion of the cuprates, and you plug it into this formula. Okay. Yes. For, for, for what, sorry, for? This cold atom formula was obtained for high frequencies? High temperatures, high temperature. High temperature. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, in principle, that's right. So, well, thank you, sorry. So the, the data at, at the moment, that's right. One, thank you very much. At the moment, the data on this formula in the physically most relevant regime in metals is a bit uh, sparse, right? So the, 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 the EELS experiment is at quite high frequencies and the cold atom experiment is at quite high temperatures, okay? And so uh, I hope that this will change over the next few years, all right? So when, once you have this formula, I'm telling you what you should do with it. That's right. So for purely illustrative purposes, I'm gonna, that, that's right, that, thank you. Uh, although that said, let's go back to here. When these systems are whacked with a laser, the temperature actually goes up quite a lot. Uh, in, in the electronic temperature can go above a thousand Kelvin in, the, in these pump probe experiments. And so high temperatures may not be totally, uh, totally irrelevant. But, but, but I, I certainly hope there will be data at lower temperatures and lower frequencies uh, soon. Uh, good, so then, so these two examples I'm showing you are, are just illustrative. So I'm not gonna do a detailed a detailed calculation is just to get some 
sense of what happened. So for example, we can just take this form, okay, as experimentally reported. So A is no, big A is known, the omega C is known, okay, the, these things are known. These are for, it's for frequencies above 0.1 EV, okay, so it's quite, quite high frequencies. Right? Uh, but just for illustrative purposes, we can take this and we can um, um, and we can couple this to an optical phonon at 0.1 EV. Okay, and let's assume the electron phonon coupling is order one, just, just to, as an estimate. So you take this, you plug with these numbers are all known, you plug it into the formula and you get one picosecond for this time scale. Okay. It's not to be taken too seriously, but uh, just it's there's not a crazy time scale. Okay, the, these 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 processes do happen on 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 that kind of time scale, which actually is not is actually a bit annoying because it means that um, oh sorry, so it means that actually the fact that the spectrum isn't coherent it doesn't mean that you don't couple the phonons because the coupling remember it was this integral along this line okay and so really it's sort of the integrated spectral weight that, that ends up mattering okay so even though the spectral weight is incoherent the, the the time scale that you get is quite comparable to what you would get in a conventional system okay so it's this so it, it has to be a precision tool right that you actually know what the phonon dispersion is and you really know what the answer is if you want to use this formula as a diagnostic so a, a first lesson maybe it's not surprising is that incoherent spectra can dissipate into phonons at comparable timescales to conventional metals, okay? Which is bad if you want the phonons not to do anything in the cuprates, okay? Yeah, all right. So um, ah, before, before, before I, I, and I'm gonna talk about the cold atom, how am I doing? How, how much longer do I have? Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> am I having negative time? Okay, yeah. Uh, I started late. Okay, yeah. Okay, so just I make I make two comments. So, so something that 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 this made me realize when I was thinking about this. So, I mean, I'll do the cold atoms very quickly. But I think this point is interesting. So you could ask, this was the Lindhardt continuum. Okay, pre fermion. So what do interactions do? Imagine adding small interactions, perturbative in electronic interactions to the system. So interactions will introduce a mean free path. Right, and so let's put that mean free path. Which and in a good metal, this mean free path is very long, right? And so one over the mean free path, which as units of k is very small, so one over the mean free path might be here, and one over the lifetime might might be there. Okay, and so the effect of interactions is only to change. So if you're at wave, if you look at wavelengths bigger than the mean free path, sorry, lengths bigger than the mean free path. Then the particle undergoes several scatterings before that length, and so the interactions are important. That's really here, and so this integral, okay, that you do to see the rate of phonons, it doesn't actually care too much about these interactions because it's. A, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Please object. Yes. So the temperature scale is is here, and. So this is. No, I, I, I'm so I'm um, no, no. So all, all this is a very a conceptual. So, so I'm saying, so for example, a diffusion. So charge has to diffuse on the longest time scales, right? And so GNN is going to have this diffusive form as k goes to zero. Okay. At what k does this does this kick in? This will happen for k less than one over the mean free path. Right, that's where this diffuse form. So this scale, forget this axis, along along this k axis, the natural scale of interactions is is the mean free path. If your distance is much shorter than the mean free path, you don't know that in, that interactions are happening. And so, no, all, no then then it's just this, right? No, 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 no. So so t much less than e. That, that's that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. The vertical, you, you already put on the vertical very similar. Yeah, so, no, that's right. But this, this very, right. But on that scale, this line is way out there, right? Because KF, this is KF. Temperature is negligible in this, in, yeah. I'm trying to say that the gap which you draw, zero spectral density, a small k, zero spectral density of finite frequency. Zero spectral density. 
Let's stay up there. Sorry, where, where do you want me to be? Here? You draw the horizontal line. This is through the spectral gap. So mm -hmm. you have zero temperature in that. I'm saying that this one will be non zero. Of course, yeah. Temperature. Yes, that. that uh, uh, it's not determined by inverse density part. It's determined by temperature. Itself. No, no, but that, that's fine. Yes, yes, no, no, that, that's fine. But the, the, all, all those broadening effects are are are, are going to be in this in this formula. What what I'm, I'm asking, what are the effects of interactions? Okay, so I'm saying interactions are important here. Let, let the background be whatever you want. Okay, so I, I'm making this is a preliminary step. Uh, sorry. So so interactions. So the. By the way, just for phonons, we're never up here, right? The phonon line is very, very flat. So this, this region is not relevant for phonons uh, ever. So the phonons are, are basically at zero as far as the electrons are concerned. So when you calculate the rate of decay into phonons, you int most of the decay comes from large, ve large wave vector electrons because you have to do the, they all, all, the, all the electrons emit all, all the particle hole pairs and so most particle hole, most transitions that emit phonons are these large, are these large wave vector ones, and they don't, they don't see the interaction so strongly because the interactions are here. However, oh, the point I wanted to make in a bad metal, the definition of a bad metal is when the mean free path becomes of order one over kf. Okay, in a bad metal, that means that the scale, let's say two kf, just to make it more fun. That that means that in the this area where the interactions are important goes all the way up to the up to up to the 2kf. Okay. So a bad metal is by definition, it's normally defined in terms of the mean free path. But I think a better definition is when interactions eat the whole Linhardt continuum. Because the Linhardt continuum goes to 2kf. And so if the mean free path is comparable to 2kf, that means the whole thing is collective. Okay, you need to consider interactions. And that's kind of what this cold atom experiment sees that this diffusive form it eats everything. It's not some small thing, it's everything. So diffusion is normally an effective long wavelength theory, but in the bad metal, diffusion is microscopic. It goes all the way up to, 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 to KF, okay? And that's, that's, that's this red plot here. Okay, that, that's just a, a tangential point. Maybe I'll skip this. So you can, you can take this formula that they measured, you can plug it into our formula and you can do a comparison. So. If you if you take the parameters from the Hubbard model that they used and you stick it into the Kaganov et al formula, uh, this is what you get. And if you use our formula, this is what you get. And you know it's a factor of four. It's not a it's not a order of magnitude difference, but there is a quantitative difference. All right. So to summarize, so the, the main point I tried to make is that we have a Kubo formula for the rate at which electrons dump energy into the lattice. That's a measurable quantity, and I illustrated the use of this formula on two measured incoherent densities, but these are really estimates. And when, when these things are measured better, we could do something more precise. A final comment. So suppose, uh, as many people believe, that phonon scattering is irrelevant for strange metals. Okay, I, I'm very sympathetic to that, it's probably true. So then you could measure or calculate this electronic Green's function with no phonons, right? Because phonons are irrelevant. You can then measure this tau quantity and that will determine how strong the electric phonon coupling strength is using our formula, right? Because our formula has tau, electron phonon, and, and this quantity. If that electron phonon coupling is not, is not small, okay, if it turns out to be large, then your starting belief is not, is not true and you should have considered the phonons from, from the beginning. Okay, so I, what, I, what, what, I, what I'd like to head towards is really trying to disentangle electrons and phonons in strongly interacting systems. Okay, thank you. All right, we are running a little bit late, but maybe a couple of questions. If it's a couple, can I have two? <laughs> All right, so I, <laughs> I have two, but I'll, have, I'll ask one. Um, your assumption uh, when you wrote down your you know, equivalent, if you want, for the Allen uh, formula is that you can get tau because the relaxation to the, to the phonons is happening much faster than everything else. Slower, slower. It's, yeah, sorry. And usually, there is an assumption, an additional assumption, which is that diffusion is irrelevant. And that's why you first get to decay when the lattice and the electrons equilibrate. And then there's some slower relaxation process uh, by diffusion. This is actually, I think, in Alan's paper. But if you have incoherent metals, 
can you really neglect the fact that your electrons are diffusing heat themselves to the boundaries rapidly? Um, very good. So, so right. So I think the question has to do with the, that's the, that's the same as very good. An, an equivalent way to state this is that the phonons have been treated as free as non-interacting in this, in this, uh, um, I, yes, I think, well, may, may, I'm not sure. I mean, I, ideally, ideally one should model everything. Actually, and people do uh, in, in conventional systems, just model the electrons, the phonons and the coupling and really do everything, everything, everything properly. It's more complicated. I should say that even in, so the time scale for this phonon diffusion is quite a bit slower than the electronic one. I mean, despite the headline of, of that paper, I mean, it's like one fifteenth of the, so the, the phonons are a bit slower. So, so I think it may be reasonable, but what one, I, yeah. Thanks.